So for our next panel tonight, Automating Judgment, Kate Crawford will be in conversation with Jennifer Lord, talking about what it takes back to what it takes to push back against broken and biased algorithms using the law and the courts. Have a seat. Thank you very much. So I am thrilled to be here with Jennifer Lord. Uh, Jennifer is here for our spotlight session. This is when we invite a person who has inspired us over the course of the year, and we want to know more about what they do and how they do it. And I mentioned at the start of tonight uh, what's been happening in Michigan with the MITRE system. Well, Jennifer Lord is that civil rights attorney who has been doing this work and actually standing up for the people whose lives have been completely devastated by getting these com completely incorrect judgments. So Jennifer, why don't you tell us a bit about the case and what it's been like working on this? So um, the case came to us as a total surprise. Um, my firm practices employment law and civil rights. So basically, we represent people who've been fired from their jobs because of their race, because of their gender, because they have a disability. And in late 2013, early 2014, our phones started ringing off the hook. And the story was always the same. I've been accused of fraud, followed by my tax refund has been seized, followed by, oh yeah, I got a new job, but now my wages are being garnished 25%. And then we get a call a week later. I just got this bill in the mail. The Michigan Unemployment Insurance Agency is saying I owe them $80,000. So we did not know what was going on. We only knew that something was very, very wrong. And so we reached out to our colleagues um, across the state of Michigan who practice the same type of law. And everyone was experiencing the same thing. So our first hint that something was wrong was when we started doing some research. And there was a press release from the agency saying that they had rolled out this $46 million algorithm called Midas, the touch of gold, which it was completely not the touch of gold. Yeah, kind of the opposite. Exactly. And they, they nominated themselves for a national award. <laughs> <laughs> for rolling this system out in record-breaking time. So we realized then that um, we were kind of start, we're gonna have to start practicing a new area of law. We're gonna have to start figuring out what was going on. And um, we still had yet to learn, you know, the, the vast impact that this had had. Up to 40,000 people um, were falsely accused and adjudicated. More than $100 million was seized from these people. And so it was just a very slow but push forward learning process that kind of even just opened up the onion on this, this mess. So tell me a little bit about how you even research a case like this. I mean, obviously the system itself is hard to see from the outside. You're getting all of these calls. How do you begin that process of even just getting the facts on the ground? So hint number one was that press release. Um, then we realized that this was something that a state agency had done and because it was done by a state entity that there had to be some sort of public records. We also got really lucky. Um, in 2016, um, this is more than a year after we filed our class action lawsuit, the Michigan Auditor General um, issued two reports that were extraordinarily critical of the agency. And that's where we were finally able to say with confidence that 40,000 people are impacted with a 93% false charge, 93%. And so here's the state admitting that they had done something wrong, admitting that they'd harmed all of these citizens. And um, beyond that, we've, we've tried to subpoena and, and FOIA as many records as we can. We're at a bit of a standstill because although we won at the Michigan Supreme Court, um, we got sent back to the Court of Appeals to decide another technical legal issue. So we're still stayed and we can't get our hands on all of the documents, but I can only imagine what we're gonna find um, once, once we're able to fully access all of the documents. So this is ongoing, and, and we're really talking about sort of 40,000 plus people who've been affected by this pretty disastrous system. Tell me a little bit about how people have been responding. What are the sort of the human experiences of being on the other side of Midas? Sure, that's, well, that's one of the hardest things to talk about because 
Um, you know, our firm has talked to thousands of people. I personally have talked to hundreds. We've held organizational meetings, um, met with them. There have been 1,100 confirmed bankruptcies. Those are bankruptcies that the state of Michigan acknowledges because they went into court and filed something called an adversary proceeding, which meant they fought the discharge of that bankruptcy even when they knew the debt was false. There have been um, hundreds of prosecutions and hundreds of people who pled guilty to a crime that they didn't commit. Again, the state attorney general at the time, um, like the Republican governor who implemented, um, oversaw this whole program, was outsourcing the prosecution of these innocent people in the two poorest cities in the state of Michigan, in the city of Flint and in the city of Detroit. So now we have all these hundreds of people with a crime on their record. Their credit rating is damaged. They can't find an apartment. They can't pass a background check to get a job. It has upended people's lives and it still happens for them. So even though the state will say, oh, we stopped using that program completely in, in 2015 and we hired back a few of the 400 fraud examiners because that's another really important thing to know is when Midas, this golden touch went online, the agency fired all of its human fraud examiners, 400 people. So this computer was operating completely without oversight. Which is extraordinary if you think about it. I mean, it is. again, these systems are not really designed to really be able to look into the deep context of somebody's life. And so you think about what can happen when something like that is just running rampant. I mean, it's, it's absolutely shocking to me. But tell me something about the politics here, because obviously there was an election which has changed things. And I'm curious where things are at now and if there's lessons that we should all be taking here as we go into 2020. Sure, I think the biggest lessons, um, before we start with the, the election that we just had, are to go back and, and look at the government in Michigan from about 2011 forward. We, we had a Republican governor, Rick Snyder, who's you know, internationally no known um, for being the face of the Flint water uh, crisis. And he uh, owned and was the CEO of Gateway, a giant tech company. And so he approached his job as for lack of better words, governing by spreadsheet. So his vision was let's treat the state of Michigan like it's a corporation and let's maximize the value for shareholders. And what I think really got lost is that when you're governing, the citizens aren't shareholders. I mean, the first job of our government is to do no harm. And that's one of the major things that got lost. And I think lessons that should be taken going forward not just in Michigan, but across the country and across the world. Um, another major lesson is let's slow things down. Um, obviously technology is here, that, that train is not coming back into the gate, but we have to have human oversight. We have to have input from, from researchers and from outsiders. Um, and we just really, as human beings, have to ensure that we are not permitting, and this is the third point, the outsourcing of government benefits to private companies. So in Michigan, a giant corporation called SAS developed this, this Midas software. And so in essence, you know, here's this government who's outsourcing who gets unemployment benefits and who doesn't. And I think that's just fundamentally wrong. Um, there were other problems to, that we learned, especially in Michigan. There was a 400% penalty that's since been changed. Um, but we need everyone coming together. We need um, researchers, we need academics, we need lawyers, um, we need people who are going to start to speak out and get out of all of our collective comfort zones. Um, when you run into something like this, we need to be trying to talk to the media. You need to be going to your senator or your congressperson, finding out where they're having office hours, going and talking to them and explaining to them the problems that come from this unfettered abuse of AI. And I think that point is incredibly important, is how do we build those coalitions and how do we bring those researchers together with advocates, with lawyers, with people on the ground who are actually experiencing these systems. Uh, and that's something that, and again, we really hope comes out of events like this. Absolutely. And I just want to thank you for the work you've been doing. It's been incredibly important. Please give Jennifer a big hand. Thank you.